So my name is Michael, I'm currently a PhD student in the lab of Professor Burkhard Rost and today I want to give you a short introduction into um, deep learning techniques. So we will talk about convolutional neural networks, we will talk about LSTMs and we will see how you can combine and apply these approaches to actually uh, um, achieve a new way of representing protein sequences in a vector space. Um, and at the end of the talk I will also give a short introduction in state-of-the-art um, uh, neural net network architectures um, predicting secondary structure. Um, so, uh, but let's first talk about why we would actually like to represent our proteins in a different way than it was done previously. Um, so I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with this slide. Um, so previously we have always utilized the fact that um, uh, proteins which share a certain uh, sequence similarity also share a certain structural similarity and therefore share functional similarity um, which allows us to um, harvest this so-called evolutionary information and um, here um, in this graph if you pick one point for example here um, then you see that um, if you have 100 residues aligned um, then the roughly 40% sequence um, identity are already sufficient um, to induce a structural similarity um, and this uh, fact is utilized by nearly all machine learning approaches in bioinformatics today um, by having this query sequence up here and then you simply search for related evolutionary related sequences in something uh, like a reference database. So this can be uh, uh, Uniprot, this can be Uniref, uh, Uniclust or metagenomic sequences. And usually these databases uh, contain 15 million to 2.5 billion sequences. And there you can already see that um, searching for the query sequence again and again and again in these reference databases takes some time even if you use the most recent algorithms. Um, so but what do you get actually out of this uh, if you search for evolutionary related uh, proteins? Um, you get this uh, multiple sequence alignment. So you introduce some of the some gaps um, in the um, uh, evolutionary related protein sequences and then you align them and create a multiple sequence alignment out of them. And based on this multiple sequence alignment, then you calculate usually a so-called position-specific scoring matrix, or so PSSM. And this is basically a matrix of shape L by 20. So L in this case always uh, refers to the uh, length of a protein and uh, 20 refers to the uh, number of amino acids. Um, and so as you can see that the sequence runs over this dimension L up here, um, every um, column here indicates uh, the log odds probability of observing a certain amino acid at this position uh, simply by, by uh, looking at the frequencies in the columns of the multiple sequence alignment. Um, afterwards you um, of course do some uh, cross-validation splits. I left this out in this case. I also left out the redundancy reduction for simplicity um, but the uh, rough outline of this workflow uh, stays the same. So uh, after you get the PSSMs um, for the multiple sequence alignment for all the proteins in your data set. Uh, you can train some uh, artificial uh, neural network or whatever um, uh, AI you want to use on top of this and then you can do uh, inference steps. So this means that you can um, predict whatever feature you've trained on based on this sequence. So in this case uh, I've chosen the example in such a way that we basically just predict three state secondary structure. Um, so we have here uh, helices and uh, coils or loops uh, basically and the third class would be uh, just sheets. Um, however the problem is really this uh, search of the, the query sequence in the reference databases which has to be uh, repeated. Uh, so at the beginning you have to do this step for the whole database and then you have to repeat it for every new protein which you would like to classify. Um, so you can imagine that this is uh, quite computational um, expensive as the reference databases also keep growing. So I know that this is hard to read here but what it uh, boils down to this is just uh, different flavors of uh, Uniprot redundancy 
then it's reduced at certain sequence similarities, so Uniref 100, Uniref 50, and so on. And what you can actually see here is how they grew over time. So what is shown here at the x-axis is just a timeline, and over the uh, y-axis you see the number of entries, and you see this exponential growth over time. And then you can already um, understand that maybe the approach to um, uh, always searching these reference databases again and again is computationally expensive and gets more and more expensive over time. So the longer we wait, the more information we have, the more protein sequences we have. This is definitely beneficial. However, we also have to search these uh, uh, ever-increasing databases then. And here are just some examples. So uh, currently uh, Uniref 50, so this is just Uniprot redundancy reduced at 50% sequence identity, contains currently 33 million uh, sequences. If you cluster it at 30%, you have only 15 million. Um, but as soon as you go to metagenomic sequences, so these are just sequences um, which um, are sequenced in a high throughput manner from uh, soil samples or seawater samples, for example, uh, then you suddenly have 2.5 billion sequences in these databases. Um, so this is the one uh, disadvantage of these current approaches. Uh, it's computationally expensive. Um, the other thing is that it's not applicable to all proteins. So you will not find evolutionary related proteins um, for every query protein which you have. This might have different reasons. So for example intrinsically disordered proteins are harder to align and therefore you might uh, find less evolutionary related um, proteins and therefore your multiple sequence alignment contains less information as well as the PSSM. Um, so also proteins uh, which are part of the dark proteome, so this is just a summary term for all proteins uh, where we do not have uh, uh, homologous sequences with known structure for example and this can have different reasons, so either they are hard to crystallize, they are of less interest for biotechnology industry, um, they are very flexible, so whatever, this is just an umbrella term for all proteins where we have basically no knowledge about. Um, so yes, so these are the two um, problems of the current approach basically. Um, and it always boils down to how do I represent my sequences, which is basically just a string of characters in some kind of mathematical vector space. In our case we always chose the way to represent it as PSSMs. Um, but as you see these problems, we might want to choose a different way. And uh, so we asked ourselves, what did others do which had similar problems? So in the field of natural language processing, you um, face the same problem. You want to somehow represent um, uh, strings um, or characters uh, in some kind of a mathematical vector space um, in order to, to do com uh, computations in this vector space with words. Um, so you're actually doing math with words. Um, and and uh, what the other um, uh, people in the natural language processing field did is they applied something like Word2Vec. Um, this is a neural network based approach where you simply um, use uh, um, small neural network and you train in an unsupervised way um, a vector representation for a given word. Um, this is one of the first approaches and it has huge disadvantages. So um, the problem here is with Word2Vec. So I think you two are maybe familiar with this approach because you're nodding. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so do you know the disadvantage? Or? Uh, we did the exercise last semester. Ah, oh, you, ah, yeah, 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 fair enough. Okay, so bottom line is we, we solved the problem of Protvec, so Protvec didn't work very well. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, true. Um, so, so you two are familiar with this. Um, the, the, the problem was that um, Protvec did not consider neighboring residues when it created vector embeddings uh, for a center residue which you, you would like to represent. The problem is that, um, for example, in, it is more intuitive in the field of natural language processing. Um, so if you have an ambiguous word like apple, uh, you would like to have two different vector representations depending on whether you're talking about the fruit or the smartphone. Um, this was not possible by using Vertovec. So it always produced the same vector for Apple, for example. Um, however, still, this is just a, a nice visualization based on Vertovec. I will introduce CNNs and LSTMs to see how we can overcome the limitation of Protvec. Um, and 
what they just show here is that as soon as you've managed to represent the words in some kind of a higher dimensional vector space, um, you can suddenly see relations between similar word combinations. So man relates to woman similar to how king relates to queen. And for example, on the right hand side here, you see a um, principal component, a dimensionality reduction of um, these countries and these uh, capitals. And there you already see that along this principal component, um, you have a nice um, uh, relation between each um, uh, country and each capital. So you might want to argue now, okay, what, what type of black magic is going on in this uh, neural network that it can understand which country relates to which capital, um, but it boils down to um, basically statistical co-occurrence. So it's just more likely to observe Spain and Madrid in one sentence than it is to observe Spain and Hanoi in one sentence, for example. And therefore it learns uh, a similar vector representation for um, Spain and Madrid. Um, yes, okay. So, but you two already mentioned uh, the problems. Um, so this was rather an introduction to what other people in other fields did to represent words in some kind of a vector space. Um, but now we would like to overcome the shortcomings of Word2Vec. And for this, we first have to talk about a concept which is called convolutional neural networks. Um, or short CNNs. Um, uh, but first of all, I want to just give a short um, comparison between the um, normal neural networks or the normal feed forward neural networks and convolutional neural networks. Um, so I think by now you should be familiar with the structure of a normal neural network. You have a fixed input layer size, um, then you have uh, some stacked hidden layers, uh, in between you have uh, non-linearities like uh, rectified linear units or sigmoids, um, and then you do a final prediction on this. Uh, that's basically the concept of a normal neural network. Um, however, as you see, you might already run into problems as soon as you have a slightly differently shaped uh, input. And um, this was one of the problems which was addressed by uh, convolutional neural networks because they actually allow to process flexible sized input. Um, so this concept was developed by the um, guys in the field of computer vision because in their case they have often um, images which have different uh, number of pixels. So they had to come up with some way um, to represent their images um, or to process their images in a flexible way. Um, because of course for some smaller um, artificial data sets like maybe you've heard about the MNIST data set which is just this uh, data set of handwritten digits. Uh, there you have a well-defined number of pixels and this would be completely doable with a normal um, feed-forward neural network because you know by in advance that you will always um, just encounter a certain number of pixels. This will not change but this is a uh, toy example. This does not um, generalize to the real world where you might have images of different shapes um, and therefore they came and also um, another thing is as some of you already nodded I assume that you are familiar with this MNIST data set um, if you just flatten the pixels and feed them all into this input layer yes this would work but it would be not very clever um, because the problem is that many of your neurons in here would have to learn similar features so you would have some kind of a redundancy in the features which are learned by your neural network um, depending on the position in your input layer the hidden layers would have to uh, relearn always what an edge looks like for example and this is not true for um, CNNs anymore. Um, but I think this is uh, best explained on the next slide. So yes, this is just a short summary. Um, the neurons in a CNN can be arranged in 3D. This is mainly due to the reason that uh, for images you usually have uh, something like uh, uh, L by L by 3, so the three um, red, green and blue channels and therefore they want to um, process uh, uh, matrices in, in 3D, so tensors. Um, but, uh, so this was rather a superficial look on CNNs, now let's look at the basic building blocks in um, CNNs. Um, so here is just one example depicted, so you have an image of size 32 by 32 by 3, again 3 is just a number of features, the RBG channels, and uh, here on top you have this uh, small filter kernel which is just moved step by step over the whole image. And you just shift the same filter over the 
whole image. And then based on the convolution which is conducted between the image and this filter, um, you get some intermediate representation over here. Or you get the final output, depending on in which position in your network you're looking at. Um, and what does this convolution actually do? Um, so this is uh, depicted down here, so you always get an input. Um, so this is related to this intuition that um, neural networks are somehow related to the structure of how our brain works, how our um, synapses work. Um, so what you get here as an input uh, uh, related uh, to accents in this case, X0 would be just the input. So this would be basically one pixel in one channel in this image. So this would be, for example, the zeroth uh, pixel and only the red channel in this uh, example. And then you simply multiply it with the um, zeroth weight in this filter kernel. So while you're moving your filter kernel over your image, you're basically just doing a pointwise multiplication and afterwards summation of um, whatever is under your filter kernel. Um, and this um, uh, multiplication, which is shown here, um, is just summarized here in what they've called the cell body. So you already see that you get many inputs into this neuron. Um, so you don't only look at one pixel, but you look at a whole um, uh, field of, of pixels, uh, the receptive field. Um, and what you're doing here then is um, always just you multiply again the value, the weight in your filter, which is trained with the underlying value in the image. What you also need is an activation function. This is also related to what in our brains happens, um, that they only fire after they reach a certain threshold. And this is mimicked in the neural network uh, case with uh, sigmoid activation functions, ReLUs, something like this. Um, and then you can summarize all of what's happening there with this uh, small formula. Again, f is just this activation function, and you just multi do a pointwise multiplication summation. Um, so this was the, the very basic idea and here is now an example. Uh, so we have an input sequence and an output sequence. The input sequence actually just goes from 1 to minus 3 and the output uh, has to have the same shape as the input and therefore we pad in our case 1 0 to the left and 1 0 to the right um, because we are currently uh, using only a, a convolutional filter of size 3 by 1. Um, and in order to produce now a valid convolution with the same output shape as the input shape, we just uh, apply this uh, 3 by 1 filter by basically plugging it over these three elements at the beginning. Uh, and then you already see that the first element cancels out 0 times 1. Then you have 1 times 0, this cancels out and it just remains like uh, minus 1 um, uh, multiplied by 2. And then you get minus 2 up here. And this is basically the whole idea behind convolutions. You can extend this now, of course. Um, of course, this is a toy example, and usually you have uh, matrices or tensors you're working with. You have multiple feature channels. Uh, but as soon as you have understood this, uh, you can extend the idea to um, a lot more complicated data. Um, so now I want to talk about something which I've already indicated previously. So yeah. So where does the variable input size come in? Okay. Yeah. Um, so so now imagine that you have this input uh, sequence. And you just move your um, 3 by 1 filter always position by position and you produce one output value. Yeah. Um, then it should be obvious that if you introduce here another value, then you can just do another right shift of your convolutional filter because uh, this guy down here doesn't care whether he's now processing a sequence of length 10 or length 1000. He's always just looking at this window of 3 and then he's moving one to the right. But, Look. We, but we also have to then expand our middle neurons, the ones in the middle too. If, if you increase your input because mm -hmm. then you don't have enough output for your input, right? I'm not sure whether I get your question. I do not but have if enough. We expand, yeah. Like if we double the size of this input right now, but we yeah. keep our output by five. Oh no no no. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Now I got it. Uh, the output would grow as well. Of okay, course. Yeah. So so uh, this is always the the, the case uh, for images. For example, you would like to have a pixel-wise classification. For example. So if your image in the input has size 50 by 50, you want an output of size 50 by 50. If we have a protein of length 100, we want to have uh, output of length 100. And this can change. So you can process one sample of size 90, then you have 90 as input size and output size. In the next sample, you might have a protein of length 100, then you have input length 100 and output length 
Und, and, and it does that for all of the neurons in the middle too, or just for the input and the output? Also for the ones in the middle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you can basically play around with this. So um, in the field of um, uh, image recognition, they really. Um, <coughs> Uh, do something like a, a compression. When you process an image, you, you really boil the image down, you go from 50 by 50 pixels to something like 5 by 5, and then you blow it up again. Or you do a classification only if you have uh, something like a labeled image that you say, okay, there is a horse in this image or a ship, uh, then you do not have to blow it up again. But there are really all possible combinations of this uh, that you can come up with. The only important thing is that you can do it. You do not have to do it, but you can do it. And uh, for example, the, the neural network would have never been able to do this. So this thing would completely break as soon as you add one additional input unit. So in our field, we always are used to somehow split our protein sequences in a window size of 13, something like this, and then we just uh, feed forward these fragments. Um, we got used to this, but the people in, in uh, uh, image recognition, for example, for them it doesn't make sense to fragment the picture in the upper left corner, for example, there you have only blue sky, but then you want to classify this fragment, for example, as apple. So for them this doesn't work, so they need to process the whole thing first and then do a prediction of this. So I think that's why they uh, use this approach. Um, so yes, so basically this is also what I wanted to talk about. So for the normal feed-forward neural networks you have a receptive field which is always limited to the chosen window size um, and deeper layers, and no matter how many of them you stack, will always only have access to the information within this predefined window size. So if we say at the beginning we want to have a window of size 13 for our proteins, you will never be able to observe something beyond this window, of, of course because you fragmented it previously like this. For the case of CNNs, as you can process uh, uh, flexible sized inputs, you can also um, simply increase, for example, the receptive field of the convolutional filter. So here we are just looking uh, one, neighbor, one neighbor to the left and one neighbor to the right. But you can also just say, I want to look at two neighbors to the left, two neighbors to the right. That's totally possible. On top, if you just stack them, your receptive field also grows with stacking them. So in this case we have we only look at one neighbor to the left, one neighbor to the right. Then you also understand that this value in here already summarizes information from the neighboring residues. And then by doing this just again, you already have in here some information which comes from down here. And then if you do this again, then you summarize also information which is in here, which also contains already information about this residue. So by stacking many of these layers, you simply increase your receptive field. Um, and this is obviously a huge uh, advantage. Yeah. But doesn't that make the signal information more blurry? Could be, yes, yes. So it always depends on the task which you train on. So it depends on uh, whether it, uh, it is necessary for the task to zoom into one specific residue or whether it makes sense to rather have an intuition of what the neighboring residues look like um, because this also helps you to classify your center residue. So I would say in our field for bioinformatics it absolutely makes sense to somehow make this blurry because uh, helix never occurs as a single element but you always have to have several helix elements next to each other, otherwise the middle one couldn't be a helix. So you have not a single residue as a helix. So that's why I think in our case this makes a lot of sense to somehow smear or blur this information. And the network will learn on, on uh, how far it needs to expand its, its window size. Or basically, it will not learn intuitively, but you just have to create it large enough and then it will boil it down to the necessary part. So it can just neglect information at the borders, which are not necessary, um, to make a better prediction. Um, and what I wanted to say about uh, at the beginning, so when it comes again to MNIST and you just flatten the MNIST images and you flatten just to one vector which just contains the pixel values in there and then you can also feed it into this network, uh, then you would have several neurons always learning again what an edge looks like. If you just have one filter which just moves sequentially over the sequence, then you have shared parameters because what you actually train is always only these three weights in this filter. And then it doesn't matter where the edge occurs in the image, but it just moves over the whole image and no matter where the edge is, it will always just detect this edge. 
Um, and this is what they call translational invariant. So no matter where in your picture an apple occurs, it will detect the apple, whether it's the upper left corner or the upper right corner. And it shouldn't matter. This is in, it makes also intuitively sense. If you want to classify something as an apple, it shouldn't matter where the apple occurs. Does yes. it also recognize apples of different sizes? Yes. So Even this. The apple doesn't fit in the yeah, yeah. So, so this is the point where I think they came up with this idea to um, make the image actually smaller, to, to compress the information. So if you go from an image of size 50 by 50 down to an image of size 5 by 5, then you need to compress the information. Then you need to somehow get an abstract representation of your apple. You cannot always say, okay, it has to be 5 by 5 pixels, then it's an apple, um, but you already boil it down to some kind of an abstract representation. And then it can detect also that it's, an apple can be like this or this. Obviously not like this, but in an image, if you zoom in, <laughs> we're talking about images, not real apples. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. So the shared parameters, this is important. You do not need to iteratively learn what an edge looks like and no fixed input size. Um, yeah, so this was just a short uh, walkthrough um, of uh, what a CNN does um, and now let's also just shortly talk about um, LSTMs uh, because the, the model which we're um, later using, which we'll use, yeah? Just one more short question, doesn't this kind of assume that all of your inputs are of the same type then? Because if you have like different, if you have different types of inputs, let's say, uh, uh, Surrounding the area for looking at proteins like physiochemical properties and mm -hmm. hydrophobicities, and, and, and like what what amino acid it is in blossom scores and snap scores, and like if you have so many totally different things but the same sliding window, wouldn't it never really learn something? Because what at, what is that? Each position in the window is constantly changing. Um, but like in a, well, if you always only have pixels, yeah, it's always a pixel. It's a, a pixel is a pixel, right? But. But what we have in our case is always also, it's just a PSSM always. So it's not like we're plugging in at one time, at a point in training, a Blossom score, and at one point we're plugging in uh, Snap scores or something like this. Yeah. So what we're usually doing is we're plugging in PSSMs, and then we predict something. So during training, of course, you cannot change the feature which you've chosen to represent your data with. So I'm not sure whether I get your but the lens. So Question. The point is that the lens is always the same, right? The lens is looking. So it is essential that you assume that the types of things it finds at the beginning are not completely different from the types of things it finds at the end. That's true. In that sense, you're right. Hmm. But other than that, the constant thing is the lens. Maybe the the, the, the image with the with the lens is the, or the, the the this one is the better one. So if the green or the yellow bit. All of these are focusing on different aspects, potentially focusing on different aspects, right? Yeah. And all you need to, to have is that throughout the sliding, what type of thing this window sees is not completely different. Right, and that's what I'm saying. Like if, if, you're doing, if you're training a network with completely different types of data at the same time, that you don't do. So, yeah. they, they so, input. so what you could yeah, so just sequences or just pixels works, but if you yeah. give one network, yeah. you can't give it snap scores and yes, Boston you can. Scores and yes, you can. <laughs> no, no, I think the trick is so the, sorry, but the actual trick is I would agree if you would train only one of these guys. This is something which I forgot to mention. So usually do not train one of these guys. So what you have here, I depicted the, the very most simple vector representation of all of this. But just imagine that this is now a matrix which where you represent every uh, residue in this um, sequence by PSSM scores and also maybe already predicted secondary structure and predicted solvent accessibility. Oh, you just uh, concatenate all these features in one dimension and then you do not only train one of these filters, but then you just train like 32. Okay. So 32 because this will be later important, yeah. but um, one filter will learn to harvest mostly the information on PSSMs, the other filter will learn to focus on the secondary structure information, and the third one might even uh, do a combination of the two. Why not? So, so my, maybe there is a relation between the two, and most likely there is a relation because we can predict from PSSM secondary structure. So. So that each position here in the input is actually a position in your sequence, and but it, but your features then go into another dimension. 
Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. So it's just so difficult to, to yeah. represent yeah. this in three dimensions. Yeah. So I chose to use this very yeah. simple vector representation. But, but of course, yeah, in, in real life, you would have here a matrix. You would also have here many of these filters. Mm -hmm. um, and then you do not, yeah, you, you extract many features. Mm -hmm. um, and what I just remembered, I forgot, I uh, talked about this in the previous talk. Uh, so, um, what I put here also, I did not mention this yet, is the sequence to structure and structure to structure network. So, this was one of the first uh, secondary structure predictors using evolutionary information, um, which was published by Professor Rost. What's the first? Yes, it was the first. It was the first. Yes, yes, sorry. Um, and. What, what he did there is he split basically the network which you can see here into a left part and a right part. So the first one does this transformation going from sequence space to a structure space and the second one going then from a structure space to a refined structure space where you also introduce the already predicted features of neighboring residues. Um, and the problem was that he had to cut here and then he had to do first a prediction um, of the sequence to structure space. Then you had already some kind of predictions which are stored in some kind of an intermediate file which are then read out and fed into another network. And then you do this refined prediction where you already get a notion of the possible structure of the neighboring residues. And then you do a final prediction. And this already resembled the very basic idea of, of CNNs that you um, do in this layer already uh, um, some kind of a sequence to structure transformation and in the next layer you're going um, from a structure to a structure space where you just introduce the possible structure of neighboring residues. The, the main difference here is that this is done in one network and it is trained end to end. So you have one input, one output here and then you calculate your loss and you back propagate the whole loss through the network. And this is important because in this case this was not possible. So you had to first train in one step the sequence to structure network and then in a second step the structure to structure uh, network. And then the, the second uh, output basically had no chance to do any influence on the weights which are already pre-trained here. So it basically had to eat whatever the first one already learned and it had no chance to change it anymore. And this is now completely different in, in CNNs. So they have the chance to really um, introduce also change in here in the sequence to structure space if they realize later on that this might be relevant. Um, so yeah. Are the middle layers also zero buffered? Because yeah. Or also always be good point. Good point. So I, I realized that I give basically two different uh, talks, uh, even though the slides are the same. So this is something which I've mentioned previously. Um, I, I keep forgetting to mention this. Um, Yes, for simplicity I've just dropped the zero padding in this case, but absolutely, um, it would be relevant here and here and here and here. Getting smaller. <laughs> exactly, this is something which we definitely do not want in, in uh, protein bioinformatics. So usually we want to have a one-to-one -one relation between our input sequence and the output, and therefore we always need to pad basically. Um, yes, so this was uh, the first part, this was convolutional neural networks, um, but this is uh, again borrowed mostly from the field of uh, computer vision and now we will talk about something which is able to process sequential data actually, so which is a little bit closer to our data, which is uh, protein sequences, where the actual position, as you've mentioned, so it might be relevant whether you're currently at the very beginning of a protein sequence or rather in the middle. Um, and this uh, notion would have been rather lost in, in CNNs, of course. The, the network could learn to somehow propagate also, especially the padded elements, it could propagate it through the network, so to get some kind of a notion whether it's currently at the beginning or the end. But why not simply make it explicit? So for recurrent neural networks, we make this explicit. So we introduce an inherent bias into the model to allow it to process sequential information. Um, and sequential information just means in our case, again, proteins, you um, have an ordering of these proteins uh, or the residues in this protein, a natural language processing, you would have words in a sentence which are ordered and um, uh, people in economics would try to predict, for example, stock market uh, developments. So given the stock market price of yesterday and today, what will it be tomorrow? And I put a bet on it. Um, 
So what we're doing, we're taking a normal neural network. Um, like we've seen it before, we give it some input xt and then we predict uh, some kind of a hidden state ht. Um, so far so good, this is what we've known. Um, but what we now also want is this loop, this introduction of the loop structure in here, um, which allows it to also absorb information from previously already processed steps. And if you just unroll this loopy structure here, you already see that we have a certain time point x0 where we always start so this is kind of obvious in most scenarios so for protein sequences it's just the first residue in sentences it's just the first word and for stock market prices it's the first time where you have a measured stock market price for this company um, and from this you just um, always from this point you start first one is initialized by zero um, because there is no previous information which can be processed um, and then you just process the first time point you get a prediction for the first time point and then you feed the, the um, basically the prediction of this first time point into the next neural network and then you absorb another um, time point so for example the second residue in our case um, you absorb the second residue you plug it into a neural network and then you make a prediction again and you understand by doing this um, just iteratively you will somehow harness the information from previous time steps and use the information from previous time steps to make predictions about the current looking residue, the residue which you're currently looking at. Um, and down here I've just um, depicted a little bit more detail what is going on inside of these boxes and basically what you're doing, you're just concatenating the, the new input uh, with the previously processed input. So again, just two vectors, you're concatenating them, um, you're, doing a, a sm you're uh, having a small one-layer neural network which you're training and you have a non-linearity, in this case the TAN-H. Um, and there, this is then uh, your output as well as the information which you carry on to the next cell. Um, so this allows you to, to process sequential data. However, in normal recurrent neural networks you have the problem that if you have really long sentences because in, in protein space you usually do not have proteins of length 10 but rather uh, 200, 300 and these things keep forgetting these long range dependencies. So um, just assume that um, for making a prediction about this residue and this position you might need some information about the residues at the beginning. So this is in our case easy to understand as the protein as two residues might be very separated in sequence space but as soon as they fold they get close in structural space. So we are a perfect example where these long-range dependencies um, become very relevant. Um, but again um, these normal recurrent neural networks um, have difficulties to model these uh, dependencies. Um, and therefore um, long short-term memories were introduced um, by... Uh, I thought that I... Put. First time, yeah. Ah, here, okay. So by, by um, uh, Schmidhuber and Sepp Hochreiter, um, at the time where they published this, they were actually at TUM, as far as I know, uh, and one of them, uh, whatever. Um, so they introduced these long term, uh, long short term memories um, and as you can see the, the inside of these cells now got a lot more complicated. So you have a lot more uh, different uh, neural networks, you have more um, uh, combinations of these vectors. Um, but we will now walk step by step through this, uh, at the beginning, maybe horribly complicated looking architecture. So just for the future slides, so these uh, yellowish uh, uh, squares uh, indicate a neural network layer. Uh, the pointwise operations are indicated by these circles and then you just do a vector transfer. So you just basically transfer a vector from A to B. Uh, you can concatenate them like in the previous example or you copy them and just let them diverge in two different ways. Um, so, the first step, which is a huge difference to the previous recurrent neural network, um, is that you basically have two paths uh, which the information can take throughout this, through the cell. So in the previous example you only had one path uh, where all the information has, had to go through and in this case we provide two ways. In this way, in the upper um, uh, way, this is called the cell state and it's just carried on from cell to cell. So this is also not directly outputted uh, in any case. So it's really just to um, uh, Pro, uh, to, to transport information from one cell state to the next. And you only receive minimal um, 
um, additions um, to this cell state. Um, so by either forgetting previous information, which is not relevant anymore, or by introducing new information from the new processed uh, state, uh, which might be relevant for future predictions. Um, yes, so this thing just allows information to be added or removed. How does it do this? Um, so in the first step we have the forget gate. Um, it just takes as an input the new um, processed information, the new processed uh, amino acid residue for example, and it takes as an input the previous hidden state. It just concatenates the two guys and then it trains a small neural network on this information and does a sigmoid transformation. So this means that it squeezes the information in these vectors to be between 0 and 1. And this allows you to interpret um, these values as something like a weight. So if uh, a value receives uh, um, a zero, then it's um, forgotten. So this means that it's not relevant anymore for the future predictions. But if it receives a value of one, then the network would like to keep this value. And these are trained. So what you're actually training is um, what you want to forget. What is irrelevant about the past. Um, so this was the forget gate. So, but how do we introduce new information? So, again, we just use the newly processed amino acid. Um, we concatenate it with the previous hidden state. Uh, we again train a, a neural network similar to the, the forget gate um, and do a sigmoid transformation. Um, again, this is just to do a weighting. In this case, we do not want to wait how much we want to forget, but in this case, we want to wait how much we want to keep from the new information. Um, so what is actually relevant uh, from the given input for our prediction task? And this is just trained here via the input gate. Um, and then we create also a new candidate cell state. So similar to the previous cell state, which is always transported up here, we create a new candidate cell state um, by also just applying or training a small neural network, uh, one layer neural network, and applying a um, ton H nonlinearity. And uh, then we just multiply the previously trained input. Again, this just contains values between zero and one. So you just want to wait how much of the information you want to keep um, or want to carry on for the next uh, state um, and you create a new candidate cell state. By multiplying them you just say okay what is relevant about my current information which I've processed. Um, and then we have to apply these changes actually. So what we did previously, we just prepared the forget step and we prepared the new update step. Um, so now we are just multiplying the previous cell state um, with the forget gate. So again, just values between zero and one. We, we keep forgetting stuff which is closer to zero. We add or we keep stuff which is closer to one. And over here, we just add the um, new candidate cell state to the previous um, cell state. So by this we add new information to the uh, whole uh, LSTM. And this is then basically already finished. So this is basically the new cell state which is also output to the next unit. But this is never um, the output for the, the LSTM. So where does the actual output of the LSTM come from? So this is then the, um, the, the last step. So again, you concatenate the, the newly processed input. You concatenate it with the previous hidden state. Uh, you again train one layer neural network. You do the sigmoid transformation again just to say how much of the information might be relevant for the given output. So this is now the difference. So previously you said how much of the information I want to carry on to the next cell and in this case I want to say how much of the information I want to output. Um, and then you just do a ton H transformation again of the um, cell state which already has been updated in the previous step. Uh, so this is just necessary to introduce a non-linearity because this one was missing until now and then you always just multiply it again. So you're basically just waiting how much of my newly processed cell state I uh, want to output um, as well. So and then you just output it via this path. This is then actually the output and um, you also carry it on. So you always carry on two states, the cell state up here and the hidden state down here. Cell state receives only minimal um, operations, that's why the gradient can flow easily through this path and uh, the, the hidden state down here just uh, uh, receives many um, operations to make the best prediction for the current uh, state. <laughs>
So, okay, this was now a short walkthrough of CNNs and LSTMs, um, but what did we actually do with these? So, um, I would say that now the rather fun part starts, the theoretical part is now over, yay. <laughs> um, or do you have any questions until now regarding CNNs, LSTMs? Okay. Um, so, modeling the language of life, uh, this was one of the papers which we've published a few weeks ago and this um, tackled exactly this problem. What did others do to represent protein sequences in vector space? Um, so this is just a recap again, uh, this was using the word to vec algorithm to, to get a uh, distributed vector representation of words. And what we did is, or what we applied instead is ELMO, the so-called ELMO. Um, it's a language model and it exactly overcomes this limitation which I've mentioned at the beginning. So um, ELMO is now um, able to assign different vectors to apple depending on the context. So depending on whether in the same sentence, for example, the word tree occurs or the word smartphone occurs, um, the, the word apple will receive a different vector representation to ra rather represent a fruit or a electronic device. Um, so this is a very superficial way of looking at ELMO, um, but then you can dig a little bit deeper into this. So yeah, this is more or less just like this big black box thingy. You put something in, you get something out. Um, but if you look deeper into this, um, then it uh, basically boils down that uh, two layers of LSTM are always just running over the sequence, absorbing the words. And in our case, you can translate a word to a single amino acid. So this is... Uh, <coughs> So in our case, you, you just replace these words down here by amino acids, and then the LSTMs just always move over the sequence. They absorb the, um, uh, uh, the words or the amino acids, and given the previously seen amino acids or words, they try to predict the most likely next one. And in this example, the let's stick to um, improvisation, um, then it would just absorb let's stick to and based on this knowledge it would try to predict the most likely next word and in this case this would be then improvisation. And so by this uh, you're basically training uh, something like a conditional probability um, given this fragment what's the most likely next amino acid. And if you look into these uh, nice looking ELMO thingies, um, they are really just these LSTM blocks, which I've explained on the previous slide. And I just realized that I put here the recurrent neural network depiction. This is obviously wrong. Um, it should be the LSTM, which is in here. <laughs> um, and yes. So, oh yeah. So what's the point of having two? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, I completely agree. We are currently experimenting with this and two is just the default. This is what they've used. That's why we've used it as well. Um, it would also work with one or currently we're training one with four layers. Yeah, yeah no, no, because you can choose whatever you like. So this is a hyperparameter which needs to be optimized. So this is just a decision in architecture design. So there wasn't some, it wasn't like by the, with, with the protein sequence. No, let's take that's that's completely from, from uh, word. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. So we really, for the first experiment, uh, used basically more or less their default parameters. Because, again, so, so now we, we <laughs> this, is, this is probably the, the limiting factor. So um, we used as a, a training corpus, so what they used is usually Wikipedia. They simply copy paste whole Wikipedia. They run these LSTMs over Wikipedia, absorbing always words and trying to predict the next word. In our case, our corpus was uh, Uniref 50, this is just a uh, clustered version of uh, Uniprot to avoid this bias towards uh, highly populated families. Um, and then we trained um, ELMO on this, so this, so this uh, two-layer LSTM. And this is not feasible on CPUs and it would even be hard on one GPU. Luckily we had a small GPU cluster with five GPUs and even there it took us over um, the Christmas break to train it. So basically we started this thing before we went on holiday and then we came back and then uh, we had the results, so more or less. Um, and then we had this pre-trained ELMO. Um, 
But this also answers your question. So why not one, why not three? It's simply because we did not have had the time to do all the combinations which are possible. So we stick to the default one for the beginning, but now we are starting to experiment with different uh, variations. Um, because, for example, what I forgot to mention down here, so what an LSTM expects is always a fixed size uh, vector as an input. And you can imagine that words always have different length, so they have a different number of characters. So how do you now squeeze these uh, words of different length into one vector? And there the, the CNN actually comes into play. So that's why I also introduced it shortly at the beginning. So you have here something which is called a character CNN, and there the um, uh, possibility to process uh, flexible sized input of CNN kicks in. Uh, so here you just allow a CNN to move over every character in a word and then get a vector representation for every character in this word and then you do something like max pooling or addition or multiplication whatever just to squeeze the whole information from uh, flexible sized words into one vector which then can be um, processed by LSTMs. And this is something which does not make sense in our case. So you have to understand this makes sense if you have words of different length. So, um, but in our case we always consider one amino acid as one word. And then you have always a CNN with kernel size one which runs over these amino acids at the beginning. So what we did now for example is we kicked out this uh, whole char CNN story and now we are running the LSTMs on the raw sequence basically. So this is what we are currently trying. Um, oh yeah. <clears throat> so uh, what LSTMs also usually do, so I explained it only in one direction, you always process uh, um, information only from left to right. Um, but what they usually do is they process information from left to right as well as from right to left. So they do it in both directions. This is then called a bidirectional LSTM. And this improves the, the performance of the predictor. So this allows it to also um, harness from information from the other side, basically. Um, so now we had these pre-trained uh, ELMO and we had these embeddings. So basically we were now ready to replace the, the PSSM, uh, which was the previous bottleneck. But how should we measure the performance of this model? Because until now we only got a score which is called perplexity, which indicates the uncertainty of the model um, to predict the next character. So this is kind of a proxy, which tells us that we are still uh, learning something while training the model. Um, but it did not help us to assess whether we actually uh, um, extracted relevant information of proteins. Um, and then we chose the secondary structure as a kind of a proxy to assess the performance of our um, uh, pre-trained embeddings. Uh, so this just gives you an overview again um, about what was previously done always and what we are currently now experimenting with. Um, so previously again you had the sequence, you searched in this reference database, you aligned them, created PSSMs, trained an artificial intelligence and do the inference. That was the, especially this was the time consuming part. And what we can do now is we just have a sequence, we plug it into the model and it spits out the embeddings. So what changed is actually the size of this matrix. Uh, so we still have of course a matrix of size L but now the feature dimension changed. In this case of PSSM we always had um, 20 um, features which describe every position of protein so indicating the log odds probability of observing different amino acids at this position. And now we have um, these distributed um, feature vector representations, in this case 1024. Why not 512? <laughs> Default. <laughs> um, so as simple as this really. So uh, this is also something which we can experiment with. Um, because this um, is actually a problem because as soon as you have really small data sets like 200, 300 proteins, um, you might run into problem if your uh, descriptor of the protein already has a size 1024. So therefore we might look into the direction to reduce this number as well. Um, okay, so now we had this new representation of proteins um, and now we also wanted to train uh, a small neural network on top of this. Uh, 
the neural network is depicted here on the left and we chose it deliberately to be quite small and easy to rather see what ex information was extracted by our um, ELMO model and not by the architecture itself. So we could have thrown a horribly complicated architecture on top of this but then it might be just the case that the architecture was really good and not actually the embeddings. So then we would have the situation that maybe one hot encoding would also have performed quite good. Uh, but by using the small architecture, we could see the direct influence of the embeddings better. Um, so here the input um, is a sequence of length L and in our case these X feature channels are now 1024, like depicted here on the right. Um, and then we trained um, 32 of these um, convolutional kernels. So this is exactly the point where you said we might want to extract different features given different input combinations. Um, so we trained 32 of these kernels and we trained a window size of 7. So in the example at the beginning I showed you a window size of 3, only one neighbor to the right, one to the left. Now we're looking at three neighbors to the left, three to the right. Um, and this creates an intermediate representation of length L by 32. So you have to understand that every of these um, convolutional kernels, um, so 32 in our case, creates an own representation of the whole protein sequence basically. And therefore we end up with a matrix here of size L by 32. And then we do uh, something uh, which is called dropout and we apply a, a non-linearity, ReLU in our case. Um, and based on this intermediate representation, we now do a multitask prediction. So we do not only want to predict secondary structure in three cases, uh, in three classes, but we also want to predict uh, secondary structure in eight classes. Um, so um, the eight classes are just a more fine-grained description of the secondary structure where we have the different flavors of secondary structure in, in there. And we also want to predict whether a given residue is disordered or not. So we trained this, these three classes in parallel, basically. Um, yeah, okay, so this was more, I think, for the computer scientists. I think you're familiar with uh, secondary structure in three and eight classes. Um, one thing which might also be relevant for you, or especially relevant for you, is um, when I try to compare to other people's work in order to assess whether we are now performing better or worse than they do, um, I realize that there are many different mappings from eight to three classes. So my naive understanding at the beginning was that there is a fixed mapping from going to go from eight to three classes, but no. So basically many different groups used many, many different mappings, which makes it hard to compare the methods. Um, and in our case, we stick to this definition. Um, and here, um, also, what is also difficult, um, you have different definitions of what is disorder. So there is not a fixed definition, but I think this was already covered. Um, okay, so this is just a more visually appealing depiction of the architecture on the left, I would say. Um, so um, here at the uh, bottom, we have our input again. We have an um, L by 1024 matrix. And here we have our first convolutional kernel. Um, here I'm just showing one of the uh, guys and I also removed the feature dimension, obviously, um, or I collapsed it here to simplify it, and we trained 32 of these guys. And you see here at the center position, we are now looking at the most left, the leftmost residue which we have information for, and all the residues to the left are just padded. So we just um, add basically th zeros for three positions to the left, which would not be covered otherwise. And we do the same for the right hand side. Um, this gives us this intermediate uh, representation <coughs> of the, um, the protein. And then we just move another convolution over this intermediate representation. But in this case, we only move one kernel over this because we only want to get one um, final feature map, which then already contains the, the prediction probabilities um, regarding whether it's a helix or not or something like this. Um, okay, so uh, now let's just check how we compare to state-of-the-art approaches. So for the state-of-the-art approach, I've chosen NetSurf P2, which was published a few weeks ago, and they test the performance of their architecture uh, at three test uh, sets, CUSP-12, TS-115, and CB-530. It's not uh, important what these sets are. It's just like <clears throat> that they are covering different aspects of uh, redundancy within the set. 
And you see here the leftmost bars indicate the performance of NetSurf P2, which is then our de facto state of the art um, uh, performance. Here you have NetSurf P1, so the predecessor of NetSurf P2, and Spider 3, Raptor X, JPRT4 are just other secondary structure predictors. And here we have uh, the SegWeg, what so we called the previously pre trained ELMO model, it's simply SegWeg to have not always have to say pre trained ELMO model, blah blah blah. Uh, so this is just SegWay now, um, and you see that there is a huge difference in performance still um, to NetSurf P2. So what we did not achieve is to beat state of the art. Obviously, we did not harvest um, the evolutionary information in form of PSSMs like they did. We used rather this indirect way. Difference is now that uh, they need several minutes to process a single protein and in our case we need far below a second to process a single protein. So this is the huge difference. So we traded simply performance for speed as easy as this. And this is something which we are currently uh, trying to tackle, that we close this gap somehow, that we uh, re retain this high speed while still have the same or roughly the same performance like they have. Also, what you have to keep in mind, we had this architecture. And I will show you the NetSurf P architecture on the last slide. And I can tell you that it is way more complicated than what we did here. So they really threw the most complicated architecture on top of the problem. Um, yes, so um, we did not... Oh yeah? Is there a fear of losing the information from ELMO if you increase the complexity of the architecture? Or no, I would not say that it's an, uh, that there's the fear of of losing it uh, because I would assume that the more complex architecture would just be able to absorb more information from ELMO if it's present. Yeah. The only thing is that if you introduce a more complex architecture, then you might. Um, uh, yeah, you, you still pick up the signal of ELMO, but you might have also picked up a similar signal if you just use one-hot encoding, for example. If you just uh, throw a horribly complicated architecture on one-hot encoding, um, you might also get kind of okayish results, but we want to just see performance of ELMO. Right, so what I was asking, does it make sense now to increase the complexity of the architecture? Absolutely, yes. So, so this is something which I also tried a little bit. Um, I did not see huge improvements uh, if I just throw on top uh, more layers. This is something which I've tried. So just going deeper does not always make it better. Um, but um, I did not experiment with like huge LSTM architectures like, like the NetSurf P guys did. Um, so there is always th something you can try and make it more complex. Um, all I want to say is that there was not an easy and straightforward way by just making it deeper to improve the performance. Mm -hmm. So you just have to come up with a more clever architecture, I think. Um, so what you've seen now was um, uh, the pre-trained ELMO being applied to a per residue prediction task where you go um, from every single residue in a sequence um, to, for example, a single uh, secondary structure in the same protein. Uh, but now we want to also do global predictions. So given a whole protein, um, in which subset of localization is it, for example? Or given a whole protein, is it membrane bound or not? And these were the two um, tasks which we also uh, looked into. So um, binary classification of uh, membrane bound proteins versus soluble proteins and a 10 class subcellular localization prediction. And um, in order to get to the global representation of this protein, we applied something what the natural language processing guys also did to represent together a global representation of a whole sentence. And there they also just summed over all the vectors in a sentence. So you have vector for every word in a sentence and then you simply sum over all of these vectors. Um, and we did basically the same for this matrix. We collapsed dimension L by simply summing summing over all these vectors of size 1024 and this leaves you at the end always with a fixed size vector representation for every protein no matter how long it is of size 1024. In order to account um, that it might make a difference whether you now have just collapsed 10 residues or 1000 residues we also divided it by length so simply to um, normalize the values. This makes it easier for later processing as well.
So after we did this, um, we did not train anything on top, but we just used the so-called T-SNE dimensionality reduction um, to break these 1024 dimensions down to two dimensions to be able to visualize them. And this is shown here on the left for membrane-bound proteins in red and soluble proteins in blue. And there you can already see that there is a nice uh, cluster of membra membrane-bound proteins. Down here you see some kind of a cluster for soluble proteins here but the picture is blurry so it's not perfect um, but what you have to keep in mind here is that we never trained on anything uh, like membrane bound or soluble proteins all what we did is we predicted the next amino acid given previous amino acids and this is the result so you have to imagine that this model developed a notion of what a membrane bound protein might look like um, in contrast to what a soluble protein looks like. So it picked up some kind of a signal which is inherent to membrane-bound proteins without knowing the label. Um, so this was completely without training and the obvious next step is of course to plug this representation then into some kind of a network and do inference on this. And as we had now a fixed input size of always 1024, no matter how long the protein was, um, we uh, could use a normal feedforward neural network. So no convolutions involved in this story, just a plain neural network um, with one hidden layer here. Um, so we squeezed information of 1024 dimensions into th 32 dimensions. We again applied dropout and a rectified linear unit. We did something what is called batch norm and yes, uh, for computer scientists, uh, this is a super weird combination because batch norm and dropout usually do not go hand in hand. Um, however, um, I just uh, empirically experimented with these combinations and it worked a little bit better. So that's why I kept it in there. Um, and after this step, we just did again a multi-class prediction for a given protein. We predicted on the one hand in which subcellular localization it is, and in parallel we predicted whether it's membrane bound or not. And that's it. So this is the whole architecture. Again, it's as simple as possible basically. And there you now see the, the T-SNE representation of um, this layer. So after training this layer, I simply plugged in the um, original uh, embedding representation again into this layer and extracted the 32 dimensional representation and did a T-SNE on top of this again. And there you see, of course, yeah, as expected, the training uh, <laughs> uh, benefited de definitely, so it worked. Uh, now you see well uh, refined clusters down here for membrane bound proteins. You see a nice refined cluster up here. Um, for soluble proteins and here you have some kind of a blurry noisy signal but the separation of the clusters definitely improved compared to the previous situation. Um, okay, so uh, we did this not only for membrane bound versus soluble but again we did it also for 10 subcellular localizations and this is the um, T-SNE plot for the um, raw embeddings. So again, without any training, without any notion of what a subcellular localization is, um, just the plain embeddings uh, represented via T-SNE. And here you already see that, for example, the extracellular proteins seem to have a pretty dominant signal, which can be well separated from the other proteins. Um, you see a little bit more blurry signal down here. Uh, about endoplasmic reticulum, uh, you see something about peroxisomes up here. So you see small scattered clusters. So it's not a perfect pic picture, that's not what I want to claim, but it's definitely, it definitely has developed the notion for what a subcellular localization might be. So one interpretation of this could be that you have these small motifs at the beginning of a sequence which always indicate where a protein should be uh, located to um, and that uh, the embeddings were able to pick up the signal because these zip codes stay the same or very similar no matter which protein you have. And then you have this, this basically this default zip code for mitochondria for example and this is then picked up. But this is just an uh, interpretation of what might happen. Um, and then uh, again, we trained the network, extracted the hidden layer representation after training, and woo, you see, training worked. We have now a nice cluster up here regarding extracellular proteins. Uh, we now also see a very nice cluster regarding mitochondria proteins down here. Uh, you see some plastids down here, uh, endoplasmic reticulum over here. 
and yes you still have this noisy area but um, I, we also did not reach perfect performance on subsoil localization so um, this is basically the next slide um, we also again compared to state-of-the-art methods. In this case, the current state-of-the-art, or what we consider as state-of-the-art, is deep lock. And uh, to the left, you just see many other um, methods which try to predict subcellular localization. Um, there is also log tree two, um, so I think you two might already know log tree two by now. Um, so it's just a, a hierarchical SVM structure of um, which tries to predict subcellular localization in 18 classes, um, and it was also developed here in RustLab. So it also uses um, information from PSSM, but it um, puts some uh, further post processing on top of the PSSM to make it work with uh, SVMs. And here the two green bars on the right show the performance for our simple SegWeg architecture. So you see already we did not reach state-of-the-art performance, but we're doing fairly well. Given the fact that uh, our predictions basically take uh, way below one second, uh, we do not need any PSSMs and we really chose a super simple architecture. So this is again something which could be improved by simply using a more complicated architecture. And as a comparison, I also put here uh, next to it the, the performance of Prodback. And yeah, as expected, and as you two also left at the beginning, so this did not work very well. But wait a minute, we have to understand, we did not expect that before the last semester, right? So we did not send you for the... Uh, yes, yes. Oh my god, yes, sure. So in the last uh, semester we were under the impression that this bar might actually rather look like this bar. So that's why we tried it. <laughs> so it turned out that it was not true, but um, this is then just science. So <laughs> try and fail iteratively. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yes. Um, for Prodwork we applied the same uh, normalization, so the idea stayed the same, um, so basically uh, I was also surprised that it performed that bad actually, so a little bit more I would have expected even after last semester. Um, so but now uh, just uh, as I said, I want to introduce the current state of the art architecture for secondary structure prediction, which is NetSurf P2. Um, and this here on the right hand side just shows the layers which they've stacked. So at the bottom most you see the input. Um, N in this case means that uh, the, the sequence length is N. And uh, they used, for example, 20 features uh, for representing the amino acid sequence. This is just plain one hot encoding. Uh, the hidden Markov model profiles are. Uh, containing 30 features, 20 for the transitional probabilities between the different states and also some for describing the probability of observing a gap for example. Um, and then they apply a convolutional neural network on top which has a window size of 129. So now we are going from a window of size 3 like you saw at the beginning to 129. You already see that this blows up tremendously and afterwards well 129 was not good enough let's go to 257 now you have a really huge window so uh, the window is uh, even larger than some proteins um, but fair enough <laughs> yeah. those numbers were just randomly set by the yeah, what I, optimized. optimized exactly. So uh, I would also not assume that they did uh, heavily optimize this because this takes some time to train. Um, but I think they just did a grid search for some combinations and then. Uh, Wasn't that too slow? I would assume that this would be too slow. So I would assume that because training, especially training these LSTMs takes a while. So if you would just train the CNNs, this would be super fast. But if you add the LSTMs, the problem is the sequential processing. So you always need, you cannot parallelize it. This is the huge problem about LSTMs. So they're really good at what they're doing, but they're super slow at what they're doing. So you always need to produce an output for current time step, and then you can only do the next time step. And this is, that's why this takes long to train. Even I didn't train it, I'm pretty sure that it takes some time. Um, so, okay, you had these two really huge CNNs at the bottom to simply extract as much neighboring information as possible. And uh, then you concatenate the input down here with the output of the second uh, CNN layer. Um, simply to allow the um, LSTM to also look at the raw input and not only at the processed, uh, already pre-processed output of the CNNs. 
And this is similar to the skip connections of uh, residual blocks in computer science. Um, then you have two bidirectional um, LSTMs, again stacked um, on top of each other. Uh, you produce one feature dimension of a thousand size of 1024 for the forward pass, then you do the backward pass, you also create a feature vector of size of 1024, you concatenate them and then you do the same again. Um, and then you do a multi-class prediction in eight state secondary structure, three state secondary structure, relative solvent um, uh, accessibility, phi and psi angles and this order. And uh, here on the left, they've just shown or tried to visualize some of the results. So the upper structure shows the relative, so the predicted relative solvent accessibility, and red indicates that it's rather sol um, accessible, and blue rather means that it's closer to the core. Um, and down here, they've just colored helices in orange and sheets in purple, and I think loops in pink. So they just want to show, so, so here at the corner cases some mistakes happen, but for the rest the structure looks pretty correct. But I would assume that this is a cherry-picked example.